Welcome to St Mary's Harefield stream service for Sunday the 17th of September 2023, our Harvest Thanksgiving Sunday at St Mary's Church. We usually now live stream our weekly service but this one is pre-recorded because our live church service today is a bit more all age and more difficult to stream in a way that works effectively. Harvest is a very lovely time of year. I hope you enjoy the hymns and the sentiment of the season. Harvest Thanksgiving church services became popular in the Victorian period and our first hymn, Come Ye Thankful People Come, was written by the Victorian clergyman Henry Alford in 1844 as a good introduction to such a service. It invites us all to share in celebrating the harvest and thanking God for it. The hymn also focuses on life's spiritual harvest where the wheat and the weeds are separated and looks forward to the day when the Lord our God shall come. So for our first hymn, it's Come Ye Thankful People, Come. today for Harvest Thanksgiving. Creator God, you made the goodness of the land, the riches of the sea, and the rhythm of the seasons. As we thank you for the harvest, may we cherish and respect this planet and its peoples through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We also pray, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So one thing which we used to do with the streamed services is to have a piece of bread which we kind of shared wherever we were. Uh, we can do that again today and we don't announce this in the service normally 
uh, if it's live streamed, because we have the communion a bit later, but please do still do it if you'd like to every Sunday. It's entirely up to you. But if you'd like to get a piece of bread together now, you could uh, do it in this service. I'll, I will come back to it later. The Old Testament reading is from Joel chapter 2, verses 21 to 27. God's promise to the people of Judah. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains, because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Joel chapter 1 verse 4 said this, what the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Now Joel is a prophet who doesn't mince his words. There had been a plague of locusts in the land of Judah, and it has done a great deal of damage to the crops. And Joel says to the people of Judah, God's judgment on you, unfaithful people, will be worse than what these locusts have done. That's his kind of message throughout his book. Well, the locusts were bad enough. It was natural for people to see them as delivering God's judgment. Locusts are a certain kind of grasshopper. They normally exist as solitary creatures living in a harmless way, as most other grasshoppers do. However, when environmental conditions change, and when they're right, usually when there's a lot of rainfall and moisture, something happens. They increase in numbers, they become gregarious. These creatures actually undergo an amazing transformation. Their brain changes, their colour changes, and their body size increases. They begin to swarm in great numbers and travel destructively across the landscape. There can be 40 million to 80 million locusts packed into half a square mile. In northern Kenya, in 2020, one swarm was reported to be 25 miles long and 37 miles wide. Swarming seems to be connected to extreme weather conditions, which we're seeing more of these days. So these biblical pests could become more of a feature in today's world. But Joel actually has an encouraging message in the context of harvest for the people of Judah who lived in the 9th century BC. From Joel chapter 2, we've just heard these words, Do not be afraid, land of Judah, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. For he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers both autumn and spring rains, as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. You will have plenty to eat until you are full. We would do well to take hold of the equivalent of that promise today. There can be a number of applications. Because God is there, and is constantly faithful, there will be good times as well as difficult ones. This applies to disasters, like we've seen in Morocco at the moment and the earthquake there, and in Libya with the floods. 
It applies to harvests. A bad harvest is not the last harvest. Nature has inbuilt resilience that can recover from quite a degree of devastation. The land can recover from locusts, as is the promise that comes through Joel. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. Joel chapter 2 verse 25. Disasters and bad harvests today affect many more people than they used to for a number of reasons. The population of the world is now incredibly bigger. The international nature of food production is much greater and it depends upon cooperation, which breaks down when there's conflict. Ukrainian grain used to feed so many people, but not so many now. The principle of there being good times as well as difficult ones also applies personally to each of us. We can so easily lose the context of life. We are prone to see the last things as the defining thing. But there's always more, and it's always different from what has been. Today's society derives its energy from the present moment. This can be a good thing in terms of the practice of mindfulness, but bad in terms of determining value. We may sometimes be called to deferred gratification, to obtain greater future benefit from going without at the present. However, Joel encourages the people of Judah just to enjoy their period of abundant provision, and it's seen in greater relief because of the damage done by the locust invasion. There is, however, always a little condition that applies in the Bible's words, that we acknowledge God, we turn to God, we thank God, and we trust God for the future. This doesn't guarantee that we will always prosper, that's the mistake that prosperity doctrine makes. But it does guarantee that we're not alone in the battles we fight, but that in all the changing scenes of life we have God as our constant reference point, who will somehow restore to us the years that the locusts may have eaten. The hymn or song, Think of a World Without Any Flowers, was written by a music teacher, Dory Newport, who came from Manchester. The words are quite evocative. They invite us to think what the world would be like if there weren't any flowers or animals or love. God has created such a rich world, but we're very good at taking it all for granted and for destroying it to further our own ends. What a difference it would be if we could appreciate, preserve it and enhance it. Think of a world without any flowers.
Today's Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. It's Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. It's the parable of the sower. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered round him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprung up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. This so-called parable of the sower probably suffers from it being too familiar. Familiarity breeding contempt. It's even explained by Jesus because those listening didn't quite understand it. But there's more than one way to understand it and to apply it to our own situation. So let's look for a moment at one thing that isn't often emphasised. That whenever seed is sown to produce a harvest yield or whenever anything is done, there are a variety of results, reactions and responses. There are bound to be. And there is something of value to gain from each of them. Matthew 13, verse 3. Jesus told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. And verse 4. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. In the context of the parable, this is a failure. The seed doesn't germinate. It doesn't produce anything. It falls on the pathway. However, have we missed something here? The birds enjoyed it. Some fell along the path and birds came and ate it up. I would think that quite a few of us might feed the birds. We don't regard this doing this as a waste of time. We enjoy doing it. We love seeing the birds. It isn't a failure to feed the birds. In fact, we need to live more in harmony with the birds of the air. We can learn a lot from them. Many have been adversely affected by the way we live and build and travel and farm. It's a reminder to those who farm the land that life is not all about producing our food. It's about the whole of creation that should be preserved and supported in the process. Verses 5 and 6. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprung up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Again, a story of failure. The soil in the rocky places is too shallow to support much plant life, so the roots of the plants are too weak and they don't survive when the sun gets hot. Well, here we are again. Isn't it good that we have sunshine? Earth's life-giving energy comes from the sun, a star, a ball of hydrogen and helium gas 93 million miles away. It makes the miracle of life possible. It brings light and heat. It causes photosynthesis in our cat really enjoys sunbathing. Not every seed can grow everywhere. Isn't it amazing that life has developed to fill every niche, or practically every niche, on planet Earth? This is something to celebrate, not to see as a failure when our favourite plant doesn't seem to grow where we want it to. Verse 7. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Yet another failure. Well, there are plants we call weeds, a weed probably being a plant that's growing in the wrong place, as we would define it. Some weeds are actually quite attractive. We have this idea that the best gardens are immaculately tidy and weed-free. People are beginning to see this a bit differently, that there should be more conservation areas left in gardens, which are less managed, more intentional planting of wildflowers, which happen locally and valuing the di diversity which seems to come naturally despite our best efforts to control everything. See, there are positives 
in the seemingly negative stuff of life, and even in this parable. However, farming, of course, is about productivity. So it's important to remember verse 8. Matthew 13, verse 8, Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. And these are all good rates of production. In fact, quite amazing rates. Success is to be celebrated, along with the hard work that has helped to produce it. But ultimately, life and growth and practical provision comes from God, the giver, whom we intentionally thank at Harvest Thanksgiving. So what might the practical application of all this be for us personally? Well, there are lots of things, but what about this one? Let us sow as many seeds as we can. Seeds of goodness, of kindness, of the gospel. Some will take root and be fruitful, others will not. We can't control that. We can't be responsible for everything, but we can sow and nurture as far as possible. The chief rabbi, Ephraim Mervis, recently said, the Jewish tradition says that we are defined by what we give. A 15th century Jewish rabbi was once asked by King Ferdinand of Spain what he was worth. The rabbi opened a ledger with the title Charity on it and began to add up some figures. The king said, I don't think you heard me correctly. I didn't ask about your charitable work. I asked what you were worth. The rabbi and the scholar said, One day, when I depart this life, I'll leave all my worldly goods behind. All I'll take with me will be the merit of what I've given away and what I've done for others. When all is said and done, we are what we give and what we sow. The hymn, We Plow the Fields and Scatter, reminds us that farming very much involves hard work. It also involves being thankful to God, who is the best farmer there is. The hymn is of German origin, written by the poet Matthias Claudius in 1782. And it was translated later into English in 1861 to become a firm favourite of Harvest Festival service ever since. It's compulsory to have this one in every harvest service. We plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land.
continue to pray for Ukraine, we do light a candle for Ukraine at every service to remember the people who are suffering in that place. And so we do pray for Ukraine, for the continued cancer offensive taking place, and for so many people who are suffering needlessly in that land. Lord, help us to serve others in all that we do. We continue to pray too, very much for Morocco in the aftermath of the devastating earthquake and all the people caught up in any shape or form with us. Lord, help us to serve others in all that we do. We pray too for that desperate situation caused by the flooding in Libya. Lord, help us to serve others in all that we do. We pray for food production and harvests worldwide. We also pray for our local farming community in Harefield. Lord, help us to serve others in all that we do. And we pray for the Jewish people at this time and their communities as they celebrate the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. Lord, help us to serve others in all that we do. We pray for those who are ill, especially Andrew Garner, Anna, Barbara Leake, Barbara Ann, Kath O'Gorman, Christopher Costard, Dominic, Gareth Williams, Helen and Mark, Jarleth O'Connell, John Butler, John Green, Josie Spinks, June Merritt, Lewin, Neil, Steve Harris and any others we know. And we pray for those who grieve the loss of loved ones, particularly those who grieve for Rosalie Gooding, whose funeral took place last week. Let us then confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. The Hymn How Great Thou Art was written by Carl Boberg in Sweden as a poem in 1885 and it simply has spread from there to become a very popular hymn today. It reminds us what a great world God has made, that world that he loves and that he redeems. It became popular through Billy Graham's crusades, evangelistic crusades, with George Beverly Shea and Cliff Barrows. And today, it's become one of the most popular hymns of all time. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made. <laughs>
If you would like to share a piece of bread, I'm going to break this bread here, to think of the provision of harvest, the bread that we need to eat. But we don't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we thank God too for all the things he gives us spiritually as well as physically. And as I break this, and you might like to share some bread you've got at home, Let's think of the togetherness that we have, despite the fact that we're looking at screens, and also the great thankfulness that we have towards God as we hear this hymn or song, Give Thanks. We end our service with a poem. Ellen McKay Hutchison was an American journalist and co-editor of a library of American literature. She wrote a poem depicting harvest time. To contemplate harvest, we need to be outside, drinking in the world of nature. Her poem describes this. Sweet, sweet, sweet is the wind's song, a stir in the rippled wheat. And in the world of nature, which we harness for our food and for what we need to live, we can find God if we look a little more deeply. And the poem ends with a simple three-line prayer. Master, consoler, friend, make thou the harvest of our days to fall within thy ways. Harvest, 
by Ellen K. Hutchison, 1851-1933. to Sweet, sweet, sweet is the wind's song, a stir in the rippled wheat all day long. It hath the brook's wild gaiety, the sorrowful cry of the sea. Oh, hush and hear, sweet, sweet and clear, above the locusts whir and hum of bee, rises that soft harmony. In the meadow grass the innocent white daisies blow, the dandelion plume doth pass vaguely to and fro, the unquiet spirit of a flower that hath too brief an hour. Now doth a little cloud, all white or golden bright, drift down the warm blue sky, and now on the horizon line, where dusky woodlands lie, a sunny mist doth shine, like to a veil before a holy shrine, concealing, half revealing, things divine. Sweet, sweet, sweet is the wind's song, a stir in the rippled wheat all day long. The exquisite music calls the reaper everywhere, life and death must share, the golden harvest falls. So doth all end, honoured philosophy, science and art, the bloom of the heart. Master, consoler, friend, make thou the harvest of our days to fall within thy ways. So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you today, this harvest season and always. Amen. So our final hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, comes from Germany, the Germany of the Thirty Years' War of the 17th century. A very difficult time, written by Pastor Martin Rinkart. This hymn is a great hymn of thanks in the midst of so much despair and suffering, the plague and the conflict. But it has a background of understanding that from our mother's arms we are blessed on our way. And it was widely sung in Germany by the time of the Peace of Westphalia, which ended the war, in 1648. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices an appropriate hymn to conclude our streamed service for harvest this year. <laughs> 